Well, welcome once more. Why don't we begin with uh, prayer, and then we will continue our study of the uh, gospel according to uh, Isaiah. Let us pray. Almighty God, you invite us to trust in you for, your, for our salvation. Deal with us not in the severity of your judgment, but by the greatness of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Okay, we are... Uh, just to kind of set the stage again, in fact, if you want to, we're not going to spend much time there, but I do want to go back to John chapter 12. This has been kind of our launching place for the past uh, couple of weeks, uh, and uh, I think a beautifully appropriate launching place. It was our launching place to uh, Isaiah 53 uh, uh, last week, and we'll, we'll kind of try to put a nice bow on that this week, and today we'll spend uh, uh, most of our time in Isaiah chapter 6. But if you look at John chapter 12, this is that section in kind of a, just a pivotal place within John's gospel because, uh, in fact, usually when uh, commentators uh, uh, you know, write their commentaries, uh, the first, you know, part one, volume one, is John chapters one through 12, and then part two is John chapter 13, which begins like Holy Week. Uh, John chapter 12 has uh, uh, Palm Sunday, so kind of right there in the center. John does things a little bit differently than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Of course, they're accounting the same story, and John is an eyewitness of these events. And uh, we talked about uh, 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 th this turning point, which we're looking at in John chapter 12, uh, that section uh, verses uh, 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 37 or so and following, uh, after all of the signs that Jesus does, and after his declarations of how he will be uh, you know, high and lifted up, how he will draw all people to himself, and this is how he's telling them the kind of death by which he would die, and that the, it's time for the Son of Man to be glorified. All of this language, which speaks, it might sound kind of strange to our ears, until Jesus, literally through the cross, defines what it means for him to be high and lifted up, exalted, glorified. Here is God's love acted out before the face of the people, all nations, uh, the Son of God is crucified for the sins of the world. And so we, uh, uh, but here in John chapter 12, if, if, if we, after we have uh, looked at all the, the signs, that's a big thing in John's gospel, these signs, the, the kind of miracles that Jesus was doing uh, that are seen by the people and they hear the words that uh, Jesus has been saying and yet the people of God, the Israel, is rejecting him. Not all of Israel, there are uh, a number of Jews that are still, uh, 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 you know, the disciples, although they're kind of shaky here, but someone like Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea, we know there are these hidden disciples, but, but the people in general, the people from whom God has sent the Savior, Jesus, a, a Jew of the Jews, born of, of, uh, uh, of Mary, uh, who has manifested himself in the world, the love of God, now he's heading to the cross, and uh, we spend all that time in Isaiah 53 uh, because John brought Isaiah in. And John, even though he quotes just Isaiah 53 verse 1 there, part of that fourth suffering servant song, these magnificent themes in, in Isaiah's uh, uh, book of prophecy that is talking about the Messiah. He is the suffering servant, a servant who is God himself, the sufferer who is God himself, the suffering servant. And in this song, we know we're not just looking at you know, one verse. We looked at the entire, in fact, Isaiah 53 is probably one of the most well-known and magnificent uh, uh, unveilings of the gospel in really magnificent detail. You know, Isaiah is doing this 700 years before these events unfold. Now John is purposely using Isaiah and by using this verse and assuming that you and I know Isaiah well enough, as we should know the word of God well enough, that we don't just read Isaiah 53 verse 1. We look at those last couple verses of Isaiah 52 and the, and the rest of Isaiah 53. And uh, uh, then this gets to uh, uh, verse, uh, now still in John chapter 12 verse 39. Here's the inter introduction into the next big chunk of Isaiah. I just think this is amazing. And yet you might think, oh, he's quoting, well, he's quoting Isaiah uh, chapter 6 here, and you're, and you're thinking you're going to read it. It, it, it's, it sounds a little harsh. I wonder what the verses 
from Isaiah are before this. I wonder what the verses from Isaiah chapter 6 that come after this. Now, he's, he's just using Isaiah chapter 6, verse 10. But we know well enough, and John, who writes this gospel by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and who is making use of Isaiah, knows that we should know, it should echo in our ears, what else was the Lord revealing to Isaiah in chapter 6? So we're not going to just look at this verse. This will be kind of our launching pad, but... Uh, But uh, uh, let let me just read verses 39 and uh, following here. And it'll it'll get get us further into John chapter 6. In fact, if you can see on the board here, you know, uh, we already did Isaiah the prophet said, and here's, you know, Isaiah 53, verse 1. And then uh, Isaiah said again, this is where we're going to start today, uh, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And then, I love this, in verse John chapter 12, verse 41, Isaiah said, okay, we, we got that, and he saw, and we have this magnificent kind of permanent picture, in fact, it's part of our liturgy of what Isaiah saw and what Isaiah heard, and then what Isaiah spoke, which is going to put us back in Isaiah 53, in Isaiah chapter 6, and earlier in Isaiah chapter 6, because we're going to get to see what Isaiah saw in this great vision. Uh, But let me read uh, John chapter 12, verses 39. Uh, This is right after John uses Isaiah and that beautiful Isaiah 53 suffering servant song that is being about to be played out right, they've been waiting 700 years, and the great detail that the Lord gave through Isaiah 700 years before is now being going to be played out in the next couple of days as the Son of God goes to the cross. Therefore they could not believe. For again, Isaiah uh, said, He, this is the Lord, has blinded their eyes, hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. We're going to get into that. that there's, a, there's a hardening going on here. There's more in that passage. We're going to look at all of Isaiah chapter 6. But the one that John kind of leads, you know, when he pulls the string here on Isaiah 6, we're going to look at all of it, but, but this one sounds, this is talking about the Lord blinding eyes and hardening hearts and lamenting that uh, the people of God are not going to turn. This is for them. It's happening right in front of their eyes for them, and yet they've hardened their hearts. The Lord will harden their hearts after they have been repeatedly, you know, he says, here I am, here I am, here I am, here I am to save you. And at some point, the Lord gives us what we want, which is not this salvation. Although he may yet come again to uh, or repeat again and bring us to repentance. But uh, uh, so verse 41, Isaiah said these things. And we pointed out how uh, uh, John makes no difference between what part of Isaiah he pulls these Isaiah quotes from. He doesn't think that there was a old Isaiah, and then a later Isaiah, or that it was a group of editors that, you know, put these different parts of Isaiah together in Isaiah 1, 2, and 3. He just says it's Isaiah, because it's Isaiah, whether it's from Isaiah 53 in the the second half of the big scroll, or Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah said this, and he said these things because he, Isaiah, saw. Now think about what you know in the life of Isaiah what he saw in the vision that he was given to see in the, in the temple, what he saw, who he saw. Because John is saying here, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory. Now who, the, that pronoun, that his, this glory, whose glory? He, he's talking about Jesus born of Mary. He's talking about the suffering servant. He's talking about Yahweh. Holy, 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 Yahweh. He saw his glory and spoke of him. That's who Isaiah is talking about. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him. This is kind of remarkable. I mean, there's a, a hardening going on with some, a rejection of the Savior who is right before them, who comes from the people, the child of Abraham, a son of David, who comes for this, and this is prophesied, and still they reject him. Their hearts are hardened. But still, God's mercy reigns there, and even some of the authorities believed in him. But I bet they kept their mouths shut. They don't want to be the first one that says, oh, I think Jesus is the suffering servant. I think he is the Messiah. 
Everything Isaiah said describes him and what he's been doing right before our eyes and in our ears. But, the, uh, but for fear of the Pharisees, man, those Pharisees, those Pharisees, they screw everything up. Uh, fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory. Here's a different glory. For they loved the glory that comes from man, not the kind of glory that Jesus speaks of when he says, now in Jerusalem that week, now is the time for the Son of Man to be glorified. But they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Ah, the glory that comes from God is this man, and this man to be crucified, this man to offer his life as a ransom, who's, uh, you know, as Isaiah 53 says, who's despised and rejected, who's stricken, smitten and afflicted, who is, you know, uh, who is put into the grave, who's buried with, uh, uh, who, who, you know, uh, gives his life for the many, meaning for all, who, uh, who's put into a grave, and yet somehow this same one is, is risen. He's alive. He's spoken of his living. In fact, the very, the very last verse, you don't have to look at this, but Isaiah 53, uh, I don't think we made special mention of this, but if, where the very last phrase it says, uh, after this magnificent gospel picture of Isaiah 52 and 53, it says how, uh, 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 how this suffering servant um, makes intercession. Present tense. There's a lot of past tenses in Isaiah 53 talking about what happened and what was accomplished in this suffering servant. But then it ends by saying, uh, yet he bore the sin of many, which we should hear as he bore the sin of all. And he makes intercession for the transgressors. I might make intercession for you if you're nice, if you're good. This one makes intercession for transgressors. In fact, he looks around and that's all he can find from uh, hanging there next to him on the cross to, uh, uh, to our present company, all of us uh, uh, together here. Uh, but that's present tense. That's an intercession that is going on at this moment. That's an intercession that continues in the midst of the liturgy, where you hear an absolution, and there's God's judgment on you. Your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, making intercession for you, still present tense. But let's go to Isaiah chapter 6. And uh, we'll end up, this is a kind of a short chapter, a uh, nice, uh, hopefully a nice bite-sized chunk for today. And you know uh, parts of this. And again, even though John in his gospel is only quoting, you know, parts of verses 9 and uh, 10 in here, um, John knows the full context of Isaiah and John's hearers, which are still now you and me, that we ought to know that full context. What was that in Isaiah chapter 6? And of course, Isaiah chapter 6, uh, uh, this is so uh, ingrained in us. I, I could start singing and you would sing the hymn of the angels that we sing every Lord's Day in the Sanctus, that hymn of the, uh, in the service of the sacrament, holy, 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 you know, Lord God Almighty, or Lord God of hosts, Lord God of Sabaoth, uh, the whole earth is full of his glory. That, has been, that was sung in, in Old Testament uh, uh, synagogue worship as one of the kind of prayers and canticles of the Old Testament church, and right into, not surprisingly, then into the early church. That's why it's part of our liturgy still, because from very early on, and you know, just universally, wherever the church was, right now until uh, you know, uh, Sunday mornings at uh, uh, St. Paul on Bar Street, we still say the same words that are still being sung and repeated all around the world at that time and on that day by Christians everywhere, but also through a really long time of history. But uh, this is, uh, you, you know, this is uh, often called the, you know, the call of Isaiah. And it's interesting when, I mean, Isaiah's a big scroll, you know, 66 chapters. Uh, we're not going to get to cover all of that, but we're going we're gonna to get to look at some nice, beautiful chunks here, of which this is a, a marvelous one to uh, start with, with Isaiah 53. But uh, there are, you know, if you page through other parts of Isaiah, or if you have an outline, you know, somewhere, if you've got like a study Bible and it talks about uh, what the different parts of Isaiah are, if you just kind of turn randomly, uh, you might run into one of these oracles, 
of Isaiah, where he is, you know, the oracles against the nations. That doesn't sound, you know, you know, real positive, but there's, you know, God's judgment against the nations, against Assyria. Although he'll make use of Assyria for his own purpose. God's judgment against uh, uh, Edom, Moab, you know, uh, Egypt, you know, all the nations, these oracles. Those, that's a certain part of Isaiah, and there's a lot of those. Uh, we also know, we've, we've sampled the suffering servant songs. There's, there's four of those, those suffering servant songs, in the, in the uh, uh, second half of Isaiah. And we looked at the fourth suffering servant song, and we know what that kind of sounds like uh, as uh, the Lord, through Isaiah, gives us vision of who this one is going to be, who is stricken and smitten and afflicted by God, who bears the sins of many, you know, who, who makes uh, intercession for us and still. Well, here, this is almost like first-person personal, uh, first-person uh, uh, singular of what happened to Isaiah one day. In fact, I, I love this, you know, for all the folks who want to... Uh, uh, throw spitballs at the Word of God, and you know, from the uh, uh, from the the peanut gallery, say, "Oh, this is just you know so much made up stuff, and and it's all just kind of fantasy or uh, uh, make believe or uh, fairy tale." And yet, uh, in the the first uh, uh, opening lines there of Isaiah chapter six, he's like stamping the date on there. This is part of history. This is part of fact. This is when this thing happened, not long time ago in a land far away, but, but in the year that King Uzziah died, which for a Jew at the time, they would have known what year that was. Actually, 740 B.C. We can find out other stuff about King Uzziah uh, in, uh, uh, as he's listed elsewhere. Uh, not, not a great king, necessarily. We're gonna, he's going he's gonna to be followed by, by other worse kings. But uh, let's do the first part of this, uh, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, which, uh, since I like to talk about this a lot, I think you probably kind of know this one fairly well, but could someone read this uh, nice and slow and loud so uh, our uh, recording devices uh, uh, pick it up? And I think, has Gloria joined us? Hello, Gloria. Could someone read Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 7? Then one of the seraphim flew over me. No, it's starting at verse 1, all the way through verse 7. Uh, Chapter 6, seven. verses 1 through 7. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six women, one... Uh, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two yeah, he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And I go all the way to seven. All the way through seven. Okay. And the foundations, the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a un- uh, people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King and the Lord of hosts. Uh, then one of the seraphim flew to me, uh, having in his hand a burning coal, that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Okay, thanks, Mike. This is this kind of this first section, which is definitely more familiar, but this leads us right into uh, that place where John is quoting Isaiah in John chapter 12. This is part of the setting for that. The call of Isaiah, uh, this picture of Isaiah in the, the year that King Uzziah died. And I tell you, it, it was interesting. I, I, uh, the, the picture of God or the pictures of God that we sometimes just think of or imagine uh, 
uh, you know, based on what we hear or what we hear from other people or what sounds attractive to us or just what we think uh, always needs a corrective like this to the, you know, how God reveals himself. You know, if, if we think of uh, uh, this sort of, you know, God is, you know, Santa Claus or, or Daddy Warbucks or this uh, almost kind of, uh, it's not just in America, but I think uh, uh, it often is typified by the kind of the, the popular or the formerly popular evangelical view of God where he's, uh, you know, kind of just a cozy, comfortable friend. Uh, he's a really nice guy and uh, uh, he, he's just, you know, tolerant of whatever you wanted to do. And uh, he wants you to be rich. He wants you to be really healthy. And, uh, and he'll, there's ways that you can work with him that he'll give you all the stuff you want so you can have like a, a victorious life. And people will look at you with your victorious life, whatever that's defined for you, and will say, wow, that person is a really good Christian who's blessed by God. And that is, that's awful. That's completely wrong. There was, has anybody ever heard, I put on the board here, this... Moral therapeutic deism. Anybody ever heard that phrase? This is a sociologist. It's a fairly recent phrase, and it's a mouthful. Moral therapeutic deism. This came out of kind of sociologists who were studying, of all people, American teenagers who were uh, uh, Christian or religious in some way, and they would ask these American teenagers what their, you know, what their sense about God was. Who, who's the God you believe in? Remember, they're going to get answers about a God they believe in. Not necessarily the true God, but how they perceive God, maybe how they've been taught by God, or by just looking at certain Bible verses and not looking at uh, a fuller picture like in Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah gets to be in the presence of God, and he's not cozy and comfortable and you know, ready for a cuddle. Isaiah is terrified, because it is laid plain and bare for Isaiah, and he, he suddenly... <laughs> He's not going, oh, this is great. Look, man, the, the Lord is sitting high upon his throne and, and there's these angels here. This is really cool. This is quite a show. No, he's, he's terrified because he is most conscious of the fact that he is a sinner amongst a sinful people and he can't see the Lord and live because he is not holy and God is holy. This moral therapeutic deism, this actually came up just, uh, I think it was written in a book. I was just... I'm trying to figure out where this came from, the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the pedigree of this. Uh, some American sociologists that wrote a book, it came out in 2006, and this is from their interviews uh, and their feedback from American teenagers as to, you know, tell me who the God is that you believe in. And you're going to get, you know, lots of different, I, there might have been some Lutherans involved there, I don't know who was involved or how large it was, I could probably get that, those details. And these sociologists came up with the idea that this, this, God, that's the, uh, you know, the, the diem, the, the deity that people believe in, that a lot of American teenagers, and these teenagers are now, you know, 14 years older, so they're, they're young, uh, you know, uh, well, not quite middle-aged, but they're, uh, they're older now uh, than they were then. But their view of God was that, uh, which is a very, you know, you can see the attraction to this, and this is what, you know, whether they were Christian or not, this, a lot of Christian churches just kind of ate this up. And say, well, this is, this is the God that teenagers want. This is the God we'll give to them. This is the programming and packaging that we'll present for them. This moral, therapeutic uh, deism, where God is kind of your therapist. He's interested in you being moral, so don't do bad things, but he's God. And th this idea, you know, the, the moral part, that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, God is interested in you doing the right things, that you should be, uh, you know, uh, you should be good. And I think we probably... You know, we'd agree with that. Like, oh, yeah, you know, the, the law describes how we ought to be and, you know, understanding that I'm, I'm not that, but we, you know, certainly doing good is better than doing bad, but that's not the full definition of what it means to be a, a Christian by, you know, we're not uh, uh, here to just uh, like a, as a factory of moral people. You left out Christ and you left out the atonement and you left out the incarnation, you left out God. And that really, sadly, is what's happened in many Christian churches, probably touching into a, a lot of Lutheranism in our country as well, where you kind of squeezed out Christ, but you end up with, you still have God, God in general, you know, God in quotes, uh, this uh, uh, deity who uh, uh, 
is good, and he says that you should be good, so you know, we're agreed on that, and that uh, the goal of life, the goal for your life is that you should be happy. God wants you to be happy. And if you've ever picked up some you know, Christian self-help books, that's the idea. that God wants you to be, have more money than you have right now. God wants you to be you know, healthy, wealthy, and wise. This prosperity gospel, uh, which is very appealing, rather than saying, uh, like, you, like you guys say on Sunday morning, I am a, a poor, miserable sinner. I confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you. And I justly deserve your, your temporal and eternal punishment. Oh, but I am sorry for that. I repent of that. And on account of Christ, the innocent suffering and death, I, I, I plead for mercy. And I have it. Now that's uh, uh, you know, kind of understanding God as he works with us through law and gospel. But this idea where God is, you know, you know, God is basically just your therapist. You know, he'll, he'll listen to your problems. He'll give you a couple of morsels of wisdom, and then you need to do something with that. And this, you know, moral, therapeutic deity, you know, God, or your vision of God, or your feeling of God, will uh, help you out, and then eventually you die and you go to heaven. And that's, for many people, many Americans, I, th- I think, I mean, I, this is my sense of where many people are at, or they're, you know, even within the Christian church, this is kind of taken over and pushed out. I mean, literally, I didn't have to mention Christ at all here. You know, mention that God takes on flesh, or that God takes on the sins of the world, that which bring off us death, and that he takes it in our place, and he is risen from the dead, And then he gives us his grace through his word, through his sacrament, and he does bring us to repentance and a new life and good works, which he does want us to do, which show love to God and and serve our neighbor. But this moral therapeutic deism, the reason I gave that little introduction is because Isaiah 6 is a a great antidote, uh, excuse me, antidote, a great corrective to that whole kind of distorted view of you know, contemporary Christianity in a lot of places where God is just this kind of cozy, comfortable, you know, aw shucks, you know, you all come up here and, you know, sit gently on my knee and, uh, 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 you know, he's, uh, uh, you know, he doesn't want to rock anybody's boat. He doesn't, uh, he, he hopes everyone is having a good time because if you don't have a good time, you may not come back to, you may not come back to church. And yet, the, 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 the picture that uh, we're presented with, as is, is Mike read it, read it, is, you know, he's a God of, you know, absolute purity in a way that we don't even register. You know, he's a God which not only inspires awe, but he is simply awe. And, and when you are standing in his presence, as you are, as unclean amidst a people that is unclean, you are suddenly very aware, if you are aware at all of where you are, that you are in the presence of what is holy and you are not holy. And Isaiah makes it pretty clear that, you know, I'm dead because I've seen God. The old general rule through the Old Testament is no one can see God and live. You think about some of the other, uh, uh, what was it, with, uh, uh, in Judges, with uh, the, uh, the parents of Samson, uh, you know, where they... They get there's always these exceptions where they get this glimpse of you know, uh, yeah yeah I mean where they they see or we'll, we'll we'll talk another place about the the uh, the, the uh, well this will be the other class my other class angels and demons which will start up next week we'll talk about the angel of the Lord who is kind of the pre incarnate Christ who manifests himself but uh, who manifests himself to uh, some of these other folks in the Old Testament and they know they've seen God and they're thinking. Well, that means I, I must die. No one can see God and live. Even Moses, who wants, you know, who's got this rather uh, special relationship with God. God chooses him to lead his people out of slavery. And uh, Moses, at some point, wants to, you know, can I see you? And Moses says, or uh, the Lord says, you can't really handle it. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll, I'll cut out a little place in this rock where you can kind of stick yourself, hide yourself, and then I will pass by, and then you can kind of see you know, uh, uh, me passing by, the, the behind of me. 
where he does get a glimpse. This is where you know Moses begins to glow so much, and you know he's pretty excited about this. And he and he, when he realizes he he's losing that glow, he he, he veils himself because he doesn't want everybody to know it's 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 wearing off over time. But uh, you know, this idea here, where Isaiah is is uh, you know in this very presence, where you know. Just look at how this is described. This is a vision. This is what he sees. This is what he is given to see. The Lord, he's on a throne. So this is, you know, king. This is palace kind of language. Uh, high and lifted up. Isn't that nice? Because we hear, in other, this, this is a king, high and lifted up. This is how we expect to hear high and lifted up when Jesus speaks about how he will be exalted and lifted up. He's lifted up and pinned to a cross. But the same the same Lord, our Lord. Uh, the train of his robe, I always think of, uh, I don't know how old I was when Princess Diana got married and she's going down the uh, aisle there at uh, uh, the cathedral and the train of her, I remember being, you know, she, that she must have worked out, you know, she must have worked her leg muscles for, for months to be able to, you know, this whatever, like 15 yards of cloth behind her. She drags this whole thing up the, uh, uh, up to the altar for the, uh, uh, the, the rite of uh, marriage, but the, the train of his robe, I mean, this, these, these kingly robes, just the train, fills the temple. And again, the temple, you know, what's the temple? You know, it's the place on earth where God is present, where blood is shed for the forgiveness of sins. The God who fills all things, you know, located himself, promised himself, there at the Ark, the ark of the, uh, the Covenant. There in the Holy of Holies, the holiest place, within a holy place, within the holy temple, within the holy city, and in the tabernacle before that, the tent. But here's this place on earth, and, and Isaiah is given to see this vision, uh, the Lord present, uh, this, the picture of the, the seraphim angels, these, uh, 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 which would probably be kind of terrifying creatures. You know, these, uh, uh, th- this was... In uh, John Rahoff, our uh, resident artist, uh, 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 who painted the uh, uh, Heaven on Earth uh, painting that's down in the Founders Room that was part of our, our 175th uh, anniversary. I think yesterday was our 183rd anniversary. That was already, that was a long time ago. It seemed like yesterday. But this was when, uh, and, uh, this, one of the great thrills of my life is be able to uh, sit down and kind of uh, throw out these ideas for, for John to think about. And then you, you stand back and you let the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the creative uh, element and a, a guy with the, the text of the Bible right before him, and, and that's what he kind of came up with, the, the, uh, the angels. It's, a different, it's not Isaiah 6 there, but the angels there around the altar at St. Paul's is most certainly a picture of, from Isaiah chapter 6, holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, uh, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Uh, and these seraphim with their wings covering their face, covering feet, covering, uh, uh, and then they fly. Uh, they're singing. And this is a, I love that. Here's a hymn that we know by heart, and it's not a human hymn. It is, this is the song of angels. And the angels are still singing. In fact, they always sing angel songs. And we, for a moment, in the divine service, as we participate and pray in the liturgy, we're part of that with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven gathered around the throne, gathered around the altar, the place where God is present, not simply to exist as sovereign Lord of power and might, but as we'll see here, in mercy to forgive sins for people who really can't be standing there because we are unclean amidst the people with uh, unclean lips. And yet God will act and take away the, the terror of being aware of our sin by saying, your sins are forgiven. See, this has touched your lips. You're atoned for. It's not just a, a gospel metaphor. It's the, it's the gospel delivered. We don't have a burning coal coming at our lips. In fact, think of that. I mean, think of, you know, if I see a burning coal coming towards my lips, I would, like, avoid it. That's going, to, that's going to burn and destroy me. But not this one. Not this one where the, the promise of the speaker behind it is, no, no. This has touched your lips. Your sin is atoned for. Your guilt is taken away. That's a, that's a sacramental 
coal. And you have that which not only touches the lips, but that sacramental body and blood of the crucified one who is risen, who is holy, 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 that, that thrice holy Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Lord Yahweh of, of hosts, who we don't simply have touching our lips, but we receive into this, this very body, this dying body, this uh, made of dust and ashes body, which God has created and God has redeemed and God will raise from the dust and ashes that will happen in our future when, we're, when we are returned dust to dust. Or if he comes before that, that's fine too. But your body is going to, this body is going to be transformed. Like Isaiah's body is transformed. But that uh, marvelous hymn, holy, 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 they sing, uh, this whole picture, this is a, the, the foundations are shaking. I mean, this is like Mount Sinai. You know, the Lord on the top of the mountain revealing the, the teaching, the, the law of God, revealing that, giving that to Moses, who would then give that to the people. But here, the thresh, uh, verse 4, the thresholds shook at the voice of him. The angels were singing, and now... Uh, uh, as they're, they're, and they're calling back and forth. Houses filled with smoke, you know, more of this you know, kind of this uh, element of the, the presence of God. I mean, it's like, you know, I mean, the train fills the road, you know, it's a, the, uh, the, the place is shaken. Uh, uh, and uh, Isaiah it can only think, this is not good. This is no place for a man to be in the very throne room of God. Woe is me, you know, woe, you know, this, you know, uh, 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 it's a bad position to be in. Uh, I'm lost, I'm unclean, uh, I dwell with unclean people, I've just seen the king, I've seen Yahweh, you know, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Yahweh of Sabbath, Lord of hosts. And then, from this moment of fear and uh, 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 self-recognition, uh, the Lord sends a messenger, that's what an angel is, that's what the word angel means, messenger. And this messenger brings a message. The message is the burning coal, from, uh, which would have been off of the, uh, the altar of incense. You know, whatever that had been offered is complete. The offering has been completed. There is no more offering left to give because the offering has been completed. And from the burning coal there, uh, taken with tongs, the angel doesn't handle it directly. Even the angel had to guard their eyes and... and look away, and yet they're there. They're always beholding the, uh, the presence of God, even as they're beholding his children, for whom he sends his angels to, to uh, serve and, and uh, uh, minister to, uh, even in ways that we haven't known it or felt it or seen it, uh, his angels at work. And uh, uh, taken with tongs from the altar, you know, that, that holy location touches my mouth and says, behold, you know, pay attention, looky here, behold, this has touched your lips. It didn't burn you up. It should have burned you up because look what it is, a burning coal. But this burning coal has the promise of God connected to it. So this burning coal will do what God gives it to do. It's like bread and wine that God gives will do what he gives it to do. This is my body. This is my blood. Eat, drink, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And this burning coal touches your altar, uh, excuse me, touches uh, uh, your mouth uh, from the altar. This has touched your lips. And here's this declaration. Your guilt is taken away. You have guilt. Now you don't. Not because you worked it off or did something else or, you know, made a decision or, or let Jesus into your heart. Uh, you know, Isaiah's just dead here. Knows he's dead. And as we've talked, you know, look who's doing the verb here. The messenger that the Lord sends with the, uh, uh, what is taken from the altar touches your lips. It doesn't just, he doesn't just wave it around. It touches the, the lips of Isaiah. And what should destroy him doesn't destroy him. It takes away his guilt. His sin is atoned for. And this is transformative for Isaiah. I mean, think of, because uh, this next section, well, now we'll get into the... Uh, 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 the second half of the uh, chapter, and this is where Isaiah is being quoted by John, the evangelist and the apostle, who is the eyewitness of Yahweh, Jesus, born of Mary, who is 
crucified just a, a couple days after John chapter 12. Hey, Warren. See, Isaiah in fear, woe is me, totally contrasted with what we saw in John 6, where the authorities were in fear of the Pharisees. A very different kind of fear. Yeah, yeah. Luther helped us to understand that ten times over in the Catechism. Fear and love God. Yeah. But be in this kind of fear. And then love him. Yeah, and which, which in our mind, I mean, I, you could speak of a, a reverential fear, but to not take away the fear part of, of fear. Not that we're just, you know, absolutely shaking and quaking and so terrified, although in my sin I ought well be afraid of God's wrath, because he's serious about that. But, it, but, but he is also serious about the atonement. See, this has touched your lips. I was going to say you're good, but I don't want to sound like, now you're good, Isaiah. But Isaiah is going to do something totally different from what he would do before. In fact, he's, he's fearful, ready to die before, and we're going to hear that uh, in these next couple of verses, you know, when the, the Lord is uh, looking for volunteers, Isaiah is going, I'll go. So let's read this uh, last, uh, from verses 8 through the end of the chapter, and we'll at least get a good, good run and go at this, uh, uh, this afternoon. Uh, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 8 through 13. And you're going to hear what John quoted from Isaiah uh, in John chapter 12, which is why we're looking at Isaiah chapter 6. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Let me stop you there for a second, Davis, and I'll, I'll go back to you. But that, that section that he just read, that's what John is intentionally pulling from Isaiah chapter 6, in light of everything we already talked about, and the, the call of Isaiah, and now Isaiah's you know, transformation to, you know, send me, send me as the preacher. And, it, and it, this is a harsh word, we'll talk about this harsh word and this hardening that's going on, to the people of Israel back in Isaiah's day. And now John is intentionally making you hear this again from Isaiah chapter 6 because he's just shown that Jesus has manifested himself, done all these miracles. The people have been hearing, the people have been seeing, but they're not really hearing and they're not understanding. The salvation promised from God, their God, has come and is right in front of them and they are rejecting it. Most are rejected. Go ahead. I was going to say, it kind of uh, is right. The, ver the very first thing when Jesus went into the synagogue is he, you know, read from Isaiah. You know, to, you know the eyes of oh, the blind will see. Isaiah that. 6. And then he yeah. has the, forgive me for using this word, the audacity to say, today you have, see, you know, this is fulfilled in your hearing. When it's he had, I don't think at that point he'd even performed one miracle yet, but he says it. All right, well, when they try to chase him uh, out of the city and he removes himself from them, whether or not they realize that they, they are witnessing what it is for, if, for God to be in their presence. If I may, let me continue. Yes. And I've got a question. Uh, I Verse I 11. Said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people. And the land is a desolate waste. And the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains. When it is felled, the holy seed is its stump. Let me, let me ask one question here. Does that sound like... Good news for Israel? No, it's pretty, I mean, this is for Israel, you know, back, you know, in the 
early 700 years B.C. This is a, a sharp proclamation to God's people, Israel, from God's prophet, for having already, at this point, rejected. And he, and he lays out, boy, uh, uh, when, when uh, the prophet uh, uh, said, you know, verse 11, how long? What, what's the timetable for this? This is, this is awful. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the Lord says, cities are going to lie waste. I mean, Jerusalem is going to lie waste. The temple will be destroyed without inhabitant. Houses will be there, but the people are going to be gone. What's going to happen to the people? They're going to run for the, to leave the city, run for the mountains. Or... And, and, and even after the, the, the invading army is going to take them, a great big chunk of them, into exile. I mean, this is the Lord's, this is the promised land that the people have finally, you know, gotten into. They didn't want to go into the promised land right away after the, uh, the Exodus, but, you know, 40 years later they get there. And even then, they're kind of slow getting into things and they kind of, you know, uh, 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 diddle around and, and make things up. But finally, the, the, the kingdom is established and then the, the kingdom splits and then it gets, you know, Israel in the north. They're going to fall first and Judah in the south, they'll fall later. And this is the promised land. This is where God is going to save the nations from because he has made a promise and yet it's, the city's going to lie desolate. Everything's going to be burned down and the people are going to go into exile. The people won't even be here. Just a, a tenth. You know, if you've got a tenth of a nation left and the rest of you have been taken captive or sent into exile, do you got a country left? Not really. Eh, not really. Probably not doing very good. And yet still, because the God who uses Assyria, who uses his own enemies to bring wrath upon, to punish his people, to open their ears and open their eyes to see what God is actually doing to bring them to repentance, God is going to make use of them to bring them back into that land again. It's going to happen. I'm like pointing, like, I'm pointing to like Jerusalem or Bethlehem. It's, it's, it's right here. That God is going to bring them back to this place, this location, and God is going to fulfill what he promised. It looks like there's just a, like this huge, mighty oak that could never be, you know, it's going to live forever. It just got cut down. All that's left is a stump. Well, hey, have you ever seen like a little sucker growing out of a stump? You know, you got to go, if, you're, if you didn't get the whole stump out, you got to, you know, kind of keep that trim and looking good. But now, don't, don't cut off this sucker. Because that sounded kind of funny. Don't cut off this sucker. Because uh, here is, you know, it looks dead. By all appearances, it's dead. And yet, if you listen to Isaiah, or the Lord through Isaiah, you'll see, no, no. God is uh, 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 the holy seed, the holy offspring. The promised seed is its stump. So out of death, out of uh, desolation, you know, the, the people being removed completely, desolate waste. Is God going to keep his promise? Yes. yes. But now, Davis, you said you had a question in there, too. I, I was going to say, I know that it's mentioned, uh, uh, attached to Jesus directly in John, but is this, uh, in some ways, this strikes me as, in some ways, setting the stage also for St. Paul when he finally reached the point with the Jews in the synagogue, okay, you reject this. I'm taking it to the Gentiles. Yeah, I, well, there are definitely echoes. I mean, in fact, that's a great example of how, you know, this isn't a total, you know, this is not a predestination to hell. There is no predestination to hell. There is a predestination uh, in, for now, in the election of grace. And you see how long-suffering God is to us in our sin and to the people of Israel, to whom he made this promise, to whom all these benefits are given, as Paul would say. And, uh, uh, and yet, you know, just, a, a, you know, Paul said, I, I give up my own life for my, for my brothers and sisters, my fellow Jews, to believe. And some do. But here, this is, you know, 715, 30 years before Christ. And this is the proclamation of God at that point. But the gospel is still for them and still for Moab, and still for Edom, and still for Assyria. And then later on, you know, uh, 750 years later, when Paul is, you know, going to uh, Ephesus and uh, uh, Philippi, it's still, and even the Jews, he goes first to the, the synagogues, and some receive it with joy. Because and where, where the, the, you know, God's uh, people are not defined by their ethnicity as being Jewish, it's not circumcision, that makes the believer. 
It's faith like Abraham's, where Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. You and I are saved exactly the way Abraham was. And yes, God did make use of this people Israel, a big use of them. And it is a sad thing to think how much has been rejected, and yet still many, many Jews who are hearing this, because God still comes after us, Jew and Gentile alike. He came to us, too, after the, after the Jewish people uh, rejected that It was always intended for the Gentiles, always intended for all people, and God is still going to come back to proclaim this word through his means to Jewish people. And they shall be saved just exactly the same way any of us are saved, by grace, through faith in Christ, crucified for sinners. But uh, 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 anyway, look at, uh, going back up to verse 8. Uh, it's not the seraphim singing anymore. Now it's the voice of the Lord. And, uh, 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 and here's this transformation of, of, uh, of Isaiah. You know, notice how uh, the moment that God declares Isaiah's sins uh, removed, uh, uh, now Isaiah is like a new man. He's not dead anymore. He's, you know, when the Lord says, uh, any volunteers? <laughs> who, who shall I send? Who will go for us? Isn't that nice? Why would God say, God who is one, say, who will go for us? Makes a little hint of the, the, the Holy Trinity. Three persons, one God. Uh, uh, and then Isaiah's uh, new this isn't the man shaking with fear. This is a man forgiven. And, uh, you know, we, we talk about our, our, uh, our sanctification, our life of good works, of which we are commanded, uh, that our sanctification uh, uh, is never the cause of our salvation. Isaiah is a great example of that. He's thinking, he doesn't say, but I did all these good works. You know, is, isn't that why you're going to forgive my sins? No, Isaiah's just kind of cowering, thinking, I'm dead. I've seen the Lord. And then the Lord acts. The Lord sends his messenger with uh, uh, something from the altar, which should destroy, but doesn't destroy. It absolves, it, it gives mercy, and it re recreates Isaiah to do now the, this good work. What a good work Isaiah will do. As the Lord says, whom shall I send? And uh, Isaiah says, uh, here am I, send me. And then here's the task. The Lord gives him the sermon that he will preach. And uh, in light of other preachings and proclamations to Israel, and the fact that Israel, even at this time when Isaiah is preaching to them, 700 years before Christ, and much of, not all of Israel, but a great portion of Israel was rejecting it. And God is going to, to uh, uh, discipline them. God is going to take, away, take them away from the land. God is going to reduce the temple. God is going to send them into captivity, far away from where you don't ever come back. In real life history, you know, you don't come back from, uh, you know, traveling whatever, five, six hundred miles, however long it was to be brought over to, uh, to Babylon. And it certainly doesn't happen in history where, uh, you know, uh, a couple generations later, the, the king, the uh, unbelieving king, you know, Cyrus, that Isaiah also talks about later in whatever, chapter 44, 45, says, hey, let's see a show of hands, all you Israelites, okay. You guys can go back. You guys can go back to Israel. You can go back home. And here's my checkbook. You build a temple. You throw in some sacrifices for me. I don't understand anything about your God, but if you want to worship Him, that's fine. And the Lord does this amazing thing that can't happen in history. That does happen in history. I mean, this is really. I mean, I, the, the more I've, I've, I've uh, you know considered and thought on it, you realize this is that was just amazing. You know, uh, put it in put it in line with all the other things that I can look at, like a man being crucified on the cross and say, how can that be good for me or for the world? Well, listen to the word of God that says who that one is and how he is, by his stripes we are healed. This is the God who wants to heal us, who comes into our midst in order to heal us. And Isaiah, who has been, uh, uh, you know, and the other prophets who've been preaching to Israel and still make a mockery of the worship, worship other gods, sacrifice to other gods, bring other gods into the, the holy places there. And so here's a harsh word. After uh, you know, the gospel and the promise have been preached, here is what the Lord is saying at this point to 
his people. In English, it says, uh, you know, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing. I'm looking at verse, uh, verse 9. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. The, the Hebrew is actually, you know, hear a hearing. You know, pay attention. You know, see a scene. See the thing that's right in front of you. But boy, even when you're hearing, you're not really hearing. You don't, don't understand it. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You know, you know, when I come, you know, Jesus, his own words, when he cries out there, you know, during Holy Week, when he's looking back at the city, you know, how he, he like, like God is a mother hen, how he wished to gather his people under his wings. But what? They would not. You would not. The invitation of this free gift, God keeping his promise, because God cannot lie and he keeps his promise. That's our confidence, plus the fact we've seen him do this. And we've heard, we've heard of this now. You've heard this preaching. You've seen this right before your eyes. And yet, the proclamation that the Lord sends Isaiah at that time to speak to the Israelites at that time is very much like the proclamation that John is saying 700 years later. There in John chapter 12, saying, boy, you keep on hearing, you know, hear indeed, but you don't understand. You know, uh, see indeed, but you don't perceive. It's right there in front of you. But unless someone tells me, who is this man? Well, he's not just a man. He is God of God, light of light. Very God of very God. Begotten, not made. Who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven. That's who that is. And, uh, uh, and so, you know, when it says make the heart of this people dull, you've had the chance. The preaching has been there for you. You know, law and gospel have been preached to this people. And now, this is a hardening. And, uh, and it's God who is doing the hardening. That might seem like a hard thing. He's not cutting them off. He's not damning them. There is still <laughs> what God is doing for them and what God will do for them, you know, when, when the Messiah, when the suffering servant comes. But God is going to send a punishment upon his people there in order to chastise them, discipline them, bring them to repentance so that, that they might really hear, indeed, hear this hearing. I love you. I am your Savior. Look for the seed who will come. If you don't see it in your life, teach your children because the one who I promise to send is coming. And there is faithful Israel amidst all of this unbelief. That is, there, there is a Simeon there in the temple, you know, 700 years later, who is looking for the salvation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit tells him, you shall not die before you see it. In fact, he even holds it in his hands. Brings us to another hymn of the church in the Holy Communion. You know, uh, 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 now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. Mine eyes have seen thy salvation. And you say, no, it's just a little kid, just a little, you know, 40-day-old Jewish boy. But you can't get Simeon off that. He'll say, no, mine eyes have seen my salvation, which God has prepared before the face of all people. Look here. But keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the hearts of this people dull, their ears heavy. Blind their eyes. This is the Lord speaking. After this time of, you know, uh, some law and gospel preaching, he's back to, back to law. Lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts. That's what he desires to do. And turn and be healed. In fact, there's a nice little, you know what a chiasm is? You know, it's that, uh, uh, after the, uh, the, the, the letter that looks like an X in, in, uh, in our alphabet, but it's actually the letter uh, CH, the, the first letters, the first letter for like Christ, C H R I S T. And uh, you notice in verse 10, this is really kind of sweet. It's, it says, Make the heart of the people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes. So that's like the descending. He goes from heart to ears to eyes. And then the second part kind of brings them back up, lest they see with their eyes. And understand with their hearts, uh, or and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts. Just kind of a little, little uh, Hebrew construction there. It's kind of 
Isaiah is pretty artful, or we could say the Holy Spirit is rather artful there. And turn and be healed. I mean, here is, even here, repent, O people. And when John makes use of this from Isaiah chapter 6, as he just did, after Jesus has done all these signs and miracles, he's uh, uh, given sight to the blind, he has raised Lazarus from the dead, he turns, uh, 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 he, he, he tur- multiplies the loaves, you know, uh, he has turned water into wine. You know, look at what this man is doing, what he says about himself, and believe him. So don't let your, uh, uh, you know, see this with your eyes, hear this with your ears, understand with your hearts, but, and, and turn and be healed, because that's the invitation that remains. Uh, and then as we kind of said there, I'll, be, I'll need to stop here. Why don't we, we'll stop here, I'll, we'll sum this up uh, uh, next week, just with the verses 11, 12, and 13, because it ends pretty cool with that stump. We talked a little bit about that. We'll get back to the stump, because Isaiah gets back to the stump, and that brings us into some, uh, uh, some of the uh, familiar Christmas and uh, Epiphany readings. Next week, then, we'll start a little bit more with, uh, uh, we'll start back into uh, the gospel. I think we'll end up doing, uh, yeah, let me see, what am I? We'll go to uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, where uh, uh, Isaiah is quoted, and uh, 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 from Isaiah chapter 7. And you know this one, you know, a virgin shall conceive and give birth, uh, call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah chapter 7, there's a lot there, not just that little verse. That verse is great, but there's the stuff that comes before and after in Isaiah chapter 7, which tells what Isaiah was dealing with at that time. And yet this, this prophecy that then Matthew will say, ah, he is speaking about God with us, Emmanuel, this child born of Mary, the salvation of Israel from, from Israel. But uh, we'll stop there, and uh, let me mark my book here. We'll just uh, touch lightly on Isaiah 6 to, to uh, put a period on that, and then we'll, we'll jump into kind of the order that we find uh, Isaiah in the Gospels. Okay, let's, uh, let me turn this off.